two overdrive continues brought to you by FanDuel bringing you everything from the opening line of the final score Brian Hayes Frankie Corrado Jason Strudwick now up on TSN two. confirm and deny later in the hour Mike Johnson will join us here in a moment and the Euros continuing Turkey beating Austria today 2-1 that's a bit of an upset Austria was favored to win that so they're through and uh, the Netherlands beat up on Romania earlier and now we're into the quarters which will resume later this week with Spain, Germany, Portugal, France, and England versus Switzerland, Netherlands versus Turkey. So I'd say Spain, Germany, Portugal, France, that's pretty ridiculous for yeah. a, for a two-pack of games in the quarters. And then England and the Netherlands will be favored for sure, likely, I wouldn't say heavily favored, but they'll definitely be favored. And Canada back in action later this week. So it's a good time to be a footy fan right the, now. The, the soccer broadcasters are just, they're built different, those yep. guys. So <laughs> yesterday, we're at, you know, we're at the studio. It's free agent frenzy. The soccer guys are in the green room. We're in the green room. They got to go to the other studio to do their stuff. And there's a little stop and chat. I, I go up to Kevin Kilban. I go, Kevin, man, you were right about Italy. They weren't very good. He goes, weren't very good. They were bloody awful, pathetic team. <laughs> like just they, right into it. They they let it fly. He goes, I, I told it. you they were awful. Like yep. they do not care. I, they really don't. They re like uh, you're you're. That's him talking about you know a country that he's not affiliated with. Like we asked um, Stephen Caldwell about the Scottish team, and he's Scottish, and he just blasted them <laughs> like he just torched them <laughs> and he's Scottish you know and that, he's willing to say that about his own team in his own country you can imagine what they'll say about everything else and you're right there was a bit of a standoff yesterday because you know the soccer crew they've owned studio six for a long time and yesterday you know the hockey crew kind of came in to take over and it was like we're not leaving the green room and I had a great appreciation for that like Stevie's in there and Kevin. They're like, we're hanging out right here, man. We'll go over when we have to go over, but we're not moving for you guys. They liked and it. Those yeah, guys it was like great. they, they great like energy like, yesterday. They like the hockey talk too. They want to hear what we're talking about. Like yeah. it is, yeah, it is a good energy. I, I, I find they're they're cool because they're interested in our sport and how it works. Like Kilban was talking to me the one day about the the Marner thing, and we were we were just in because he was in the studio. I was in the studio. He goes just pay him to go away. Just give him a couple million dollars. Tell him we'll, <laughs> yeah. we'll trade you. I'm like it doesn't work don't, that way. Don't work that way. Yeah, right. Well, why not? <laughs> It doesn't work that way, exactly. Yeah. And then you ask them, it's like, well, why doesn't Mbappe have a full no move? You're like, doesn't work that way. You know, right. like over there, you can just make anyone move whenever you want to move. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it was great to see them and a lot of energy yesterday. And, you know, the Mariners scene, we're not, we're not, you can't talk about it every day until you get to camp. Like, it's so, this, this was a big week. This was a big week. And I was of the belief and I remain of the belief if the Leafs were really, really looking to move off him. Not just willing to, you know, improve your team and talk about it. And if someone blows their socks off, okay, then we'll address it. I mean actively trying to move off Mitch Marner or John Tavares, for that matter, whoever, whoever you're going to use in terms of the core four whose deal is up after this year. I think it would have been evident and well-known by now. I think that had to happen at the draft, if not on July 1st. You know, maybe you sign a, you pay a signing bonus and then you make a move. But I think the reporting would have been more substantial. Like, this is happening. This is moving in an ugly direction one way or the other. Um, I don't think that's the case. Um, Brad Tree Living didn't really give much of an answer on Mitch. He just continued to toe the company line. Great player. We love Mitch. He's prepping for the year. I don't know. You know why, Hayes? You know why? Like, you can't make anything like that public. It can't get out there. Because even if the trade goes well, let's say you find a way to pull this thing off. Are you winning that trade? I'm not sure if you are. I, I don't <laughs> no. know. I mean, without Hard knowing you're it's not, coming back. You're not winning the you trade. And then, and then with it public, and then with it public, and then, you know, everyone knowing, well, now you have to do something. Where's your leverage there? Where's your negotiating power? So you, I think you have to be – you have to be so quiet and so careful you because you're not winning stealth, the trade. Though? Like, do you think with a player of this status in a market like this, like they could have something in the drawer right now without anybody knowing about it? it I just, unlikely. I don't think so. Like, because at some point they'd have to address it with Marner, with Marner's camp, or something would come out even from Mitch. Like, it could be Mitch being proactive one way or the other, saying, "This is how I'm going to play it." You know, this is how it's going to work. Um, so I, I don't know. I think it's been awfully quiet, and I think that's probably the plan and um 
you know, prior to a month ago, it it was louder. A month ago, there was way more speculation, albeit, and to be fair to the Leafs and everyone involved from the outside, not the inside, the Leafs have never said anything. The Leafs have never tipped their hand one way or the other. Uh, we've just been reading the tea leaves. What did he say? What did he not say? What's his tone like? What is it, you know, compared to last year after they missed in the playoffs or lost in the playoffs? But from the outside, it was like something's going to give. Got to do something. And now it's July 2nd, and I don't get the impression like that's the case anymore. Maybe the Leafs knew. Once you get through July 1, dust settles, people go on vacation, the, you know, hockey goes away for a while, and they're aware that people are still going to show up in the fall and be rooting for this team. And if you're a Leaf fan, of course you're going to. You want to see them do well. Um, here's Mike Johnson, our TSN hockey analyst, joining us here on the Maple Toyota Hotline. How are you doing, Johnny? Hey. I must first congratulate you on your big debate win yesterday. Thank you. <laughs> Thank me you. and Craig. You know how much I hate losing at anything, especially arguing. Yeah. <laughs> she did a little bit with prepackaged graphics as well as an overdrive member with the deciding vote. Right. But nonetheless, I'm not a sore loser, so congratulations to that. Um, and, yes, I just walked into the cottage. You are officially – conversation at work this year I love after it. you and this i don't talk to anyone until september and it's okay. gonna be glorious all right yeah. well you know what let's let's lead there and i appreciate you being uh you know a bigger man and and allowing me to have my moment to shine and i need i'd be remiss not to mention carlo koliakovo who was just a great partner in crime in terms of what we brought to the table yesterday your american team very good team that's gonna be fun we'll see how it plays out in february frankie <laughs> don't pretend like i don't know how you voted I know you voted for the states. I know I had a Canada at. card too. I had and I called Mike Lane over. I said, "Laner, hand Flip me the it. American card." That's okay. All right, you were an undecided <laughs> voter. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, but in terms of what we were just talking about, like when you pick yeah. up the phone post Labor Day and we're talking to you, um, you think this is it for the Leafs? You know, like how much more change would you expect based on what we know on July second compared to, let's say, September tenth? So big picture, I do think like Mitch Marner will be back. I think he will still be with the team. I think you laid it out perfectly. And maybe the the wisdom of perspective of Shani and Trey Living saying like, listen, it's a it's a firestorm right now. Those first couple of weeks after they lost to Boston, and it was like Mitch has got to go, Mitch has got to go, Mitch has got to go. And maybe they accurately read that. You know what? Give it a little time. Cooler heads prevail, and it won't be so. Potent. It, it might still be out there, but it won't be so loud. And things will just settle down. And whether they do an extension or not, I do think that Craig Berube is going to get a chance to coach Mitch Martin. And I think they want to see what this team looks like with the goaltending they have, the defense they have, which we can get into, and, and, and the, most of the core group returning. Two guys stand out to me that may – well, the Nick Robertson thing is fascinating because, like, if he actually asked for a trade or not, it's sort of – sort of gone under sort of reported in all the news of the last few days, but that's a weird, I don't know exactly why he would do that, but with a new coach coming in, presumably if he didn't like how you're getting treated under the old coach, well, there's a new guy, right? So the need to ask for a trade might seem premature, maybe as a contractual thing, but I just thought with a new coach and more experience and a decent year for him, this would have been the year on this team where he could have found himself playing with good players on a really good team, and maybe taking another step. So the Robertson thing has to score, sort itself out if that's going to be a trade or if they figure out how to sign him. And if he wants out, I'm curious to see how that is, is handled. And then the only other one to me is, is you know, Timothy Lilgren, they got that two-year deal for $3 million per. And, you know, I think he's a better defenseman than some other people might think he is. He's like, he has his flaws, but he also has his, his strengths. But that, to me, is a... a the easiest tradable contract, like a two-year, two-year, three million dollar contract for a you know decent up-and-coming defenseman, you could flip that in a heartbeat if you needed to free up space to get another forward to find a third-line center, whatever you might be looking for. So, those are the kind of moves that might happen. Beyond that, Hayes, I don't think we're in for much. I think it's just sort of get the team together, figure out how they look, and then we'll see what happens next year. Yeah, I like where it heads at there, Johnny. Now, uh, let's talk about the goaltenders and the D together as a group. You know, do mm-hmm. you consider this uh, this change that they've made? Is that enough of an upgrade to kind of stabilize each other, right? The D stabilize the goalie, and the goalie kind of stabilize the, the D. So here's the big question. I don't have the answer. 
if Stolar can play like he played last year, because depending on where you look, he was in the top one, two, three in the entire league in goal save above expected per start. Like literally one of the best goalies in the league last year. So if he plays anything like that, then I like the goaltending off a lot of Joseph Wall can stay healthy and Stolar is just something like he was last year. They're going to be really good. Uh, they will also be helped by a defense that, you know, Chris Tanev was number one priority for the Toronto Maple Leafs, and they got him because they got him on a contract till he's 40, which he almost certainly won't play the length of, but whatever, that's neither here nor there. They can worry about that four years down the road. But I think the whole goal study, you know this, like getting more out of Morgan Riley, Chris Tanev's job, to do what he does defensively, to be the great eraser, one of the – what is is this? He's this generation's best defensive defenseman since Nicholas Charmelson. You know what I mean? Like a far guy who just, yeah, just does defense. Like, that. like that's what he is. And he seems to be the perfect partner for Morgan Riley because Morgan Riley does offensive things really well, but defensive things not so much. Chris Tanev the, the opposite. So maybe together, and they have played together briefly at the World Championships, and they've talked to, already to each other about playing together. Like they are a hundred percent starting camp as partners. If that brings more out of Morgan Riley and that first pair gets better, which I think it should, that's a table-setting pair. And then I don't even know how the rest works out. You can tell me. Is it Benoit and McCabe and then Ekman Larson and Lilligren? Is that, is that what it is? Is it mm-hmm. McCabe and Ekman Larson and then Lilligren and Benoit? I don't know how those second and third pairs shake out, but Oliver Ekman Larson played really well. I thought Jake McCabe had a fantastic last 50 games last year. So the pieces should be there to be better, to be cohesive, to be better defensively, to be more physical, um, and hopefully to move the puck out of their own end faster so they don't have to play there so much so that the offensive guys get more touches in the offensive zone, letting them do what they do well, and helping the goalies. On paper, like everyone's moves like yesterday, on paper, they look pretty good. We'll see if they happen to work out in actuality. (laughs) I think that's how I might be leaning to start things off just because McCabe and Benoit, like it seemed like they had something good going. Like I wouldn't be married to it, but I would probably be thinking Tanev, Riley, Benoit, McCabe, Ekman, Larson, Lilligren, see if those guys can be, you know, 15 to 17 minute, you know, puck moving guys, whatever, stay out of trouble would be the the main thing with those guys. But MJ, if the Leafs were to bring in, like, this is the forward group they're going to go with. So presumably mm-hmm. it would be Bobby McMahon taking the place of uh, Tyler Bertuzzi. Maybe there's more of an opportunity for Nick Robertson somewhere. Like, are you okay with that, you know, 12 to 13 forward starting the season next year? Of course I'm okay with the offense. Although, you know, it's strange because it's the offense that hurts Toronto in the end all the time. But, you know, every year they're a top five scoring <laughs> team. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to complain about offense. They had a guy who scored 70. They got a hundred point players. Like, they have all the players. Now, how those players play with each other, does Max Domi get a long run if everyone's healthy with Austin Matthews? That's very interesting to me. I'm not sure how they work that rotation. Is it did Mitch and, and Max? Like, you know, where's Matthew Nyes goes? They have interesting pieces for Craig Berube to, to work through. They still need a third-line center, though, right? Like, mm-hmm. I don't even know who their third-line center is if it was right now because I don't think they want it to be Max Domi. I don't think they want it to be David Camp. So, I don't know if it's a yarn croak can do it, sort of. They, they, they don't really have one. They need Adam Henrique, Struddy, is what they need. They need yep. Adam Henrique oh. to come in and do what Henrique did for Edmonton for Toronto. Like, make that third line hum like he did for the Edmonton Oilers. That's the one spot, and that's where the, that's where the Lilligren trade, to me, if they can find a, a, a serviceable third line centerman for Lilligren or something like that, or for Nick Robertson. Like, that's where that deal makes sense. But, no, nah, Frankie, I'm not going to be concerned about the Fords. I'm not going to be concerned about the power plan or Mark Savard. Like, they're going to score. They've always scored in the regular season. The bigger question is, stylistically, will they score in the playoffs? And we won't know until they get there. Mm-hmm. I've got thoughts on Barube and his systems and what he did in St. Louis. We can get into those in the fall. But I don't think personnel-wise, other than a third-line center spot, I don't – they, I don't even know what they need. Like they're 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 very well situated. Yep, they're a good team. I, like I, I think yeah, you know the goal they're a good te- team. They're a right. good team. Like that's that's the thing about you know discussing the Leafs, is it, it's you know it's very focused like hyper focused analysis and hyper focused criticism. Mm-hmm. Even. Now outside of the the larger picture of history that they haven't won in so long and all, and they got to own that. That's their history. They got to own that, but. You know, I, I'll be accused sometimes, like, "Oh, you're on top of it. You're you're too you're you're too hard on them, or whatever." Like, I'm not suggesting this team's, 
you know, going to finish with 75 points or nine. We're talking about them going from like B plus to A, you know, or or an A minus to an A plus. Like that's the right. group they are. That's the company they're in. And you look at their team and I guess the, the best way to put it is if I didn't know their history, if I wasn't aware of the way things flame out in the playoffs and, mm-hmm. you know, they do it to themselves and all these self-inflicted wounds, I would look at them on paper. Yes, goaltending is concerned. Like Joseph Wall and Stolarts, I don't know what that's going to look like. I'm, I'm curious. I, I like the fact that there's potential with both. I think Wall, when he has played and been healthy, has shown very positive signs. And if he stays healthy and grows on that, I think you really might have something great there. Hey, we need to remember, it was Stuart Skinner and Pickard yes. who just got to the cup final. Right. Yep, and, and and obviously that worked out for them very well. They got all the way to a game seven. And obviously the Leafs are, are playing. They're going down that road. They're, they're not chasing uh, Bob or a Vasilevsky or a Shesterkin or whatever. They're going down this road. Um, but, again, as, as I was saying, like if I didn't know their history, I would look at the Leafs on paper and say that's a really good team. Like it's a really, really good team and a team that I could see doing a lot of really good stuff. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, that's, that's I guess, the, the point that's to be they, made that's here. That's the bet that they've made. For right. themselves with right. their history, we we you can't ignore their history. Where and it's not just like, and I don't think sometimes it's fair to hold the Leafs what happened in the 2000s. Like, but they need to own the history that they're part of. Yes, which which is long enough. Enough years where you're like, well, this is why we we nitpick at the very smallest things. Like, you could take this Leaf roster. Race the history. How many franchises around the league would say we would like to be where they are? There would be twenty-five mm-hmm. or something, right? Like the, the, the Leafs are a really good team, and you're right. Like they're trying to get themselves from being, you know, thirteen to nine in the league to being six to one in the league. Like they're trying to make that. Which in golf parlance, right? Like it's a lot harder to go from a Five to one handicap than it is from a twenty to a five handicap. Right. Those last steps are the hardest to make, and the Leafs are proving us that it's correct year after year after year. One thing you can say though, Hayes, is that yes, the core four is there, but it's not like they're not different. It's not like they went status quo again. They got a new coach. They completely revamped their defense, and they've changed their goaltending. So, yes, it always comes down to scoring goals guys up front, but. They at least, if you're a fan, like, how could you possibly run it back? They're not remotely running it back. They're going to be looking very different yeah. next year. Yeah, Johnny, this, this is what I see. I, I think what will happen is that Greg Rue is going to come in. He's going to, you know, tweak the, the systems and, and, and ask players to maybe play in a slightly different way. They'll evaluate all year. And then we'll find out next summer who is and who isn't in this group. And I think that's because great. You don't know how it's going to affect it. So they made some nice tweaks this year, you know, the, the adjustments. But that's, I mean, and that's pretty simplistic. But that's oftentimes what happens when a new coach comes in. Hey, give me a chance. Give me a chance with Marner. What team, what, I'm guessing, what coach would want to have a chance to try to, not that he has to be completely changed, but just adjust his game in some way to be more suited to a little bit heavier style in the playoffs. Yeah, you're exactly right. And, and, you know, what is it? The leverage can't change their spots, whatever the expression is. Like, sometimes yeah. you are what you are. And, and, and maybe Mitch Marner is a player, much like our Temi Panarin, who is world, world class in the regular season and maybe gets really, really good in the playoffs. Just like, it's just not, it's, they just don't do the stuff that translate quite as well. But you can try to manage that the best you can. And, and that, maybe that's something at least we'll learn to live with. Um, if they just have a, a, just a smidgen of success in the playoffs, all this kind of, narrative goes away but yeah it's going to be another year and i i almost give the leafs credit year after year now it's been like four or five years in a row where we said what they do in the regular season doesn't matter and yet they still manage to you know get together battle hard set records light the league on fire in the regular season i give them credit for year over year they still come to play even though they know they only will really be evaluated historically on what they do or don't do in the playoffs same group once again craig berube now on the clock but you're right, Shreddy. Like, what coach wouldn't want? Like, give me a talented team, and let me see if I can yeah. make them better, as opposed to give me a team without talent that somehow I have to try to mask the deficiencies in talent. Like, that's that's a way harder job than the one he has with trying to get Mitch Marder or whoever to try to play a, a better, more productive style in the playoffs. And and I think they will work all season towards it. That's the other part of it, right? Like, the idea that. They play one win the regular season, and then they kind of have to dial it up in the playoffs. 
I think what Craig Berube will be trying to get them to do is let's get on that train a little earlier. Like, let's mm-hmm. figure out what we're doing. And if that means that, you know, Austin scores 53 instead of 70, if that means Mitch gets 100 points instead of 110 and Willie gets 90, whatever it is, like, let's be okay with that because – we're prepping ourselves for the bigger challenge, which we need practice trying to get through. With Mike Johnson, our TSN hockey analyst, we were doing like a vibe check thing earlier, talking about Edmonton. And, you know, you mentioned Henrik, who's now returning to Edmonton, Brown returning, Janmark returning, that third line mm-hmm. that was so good against Florida and late in the playoffs. Uh, Jeff Skinner had multiple options. He, he said, I want to go there. Corey Perry, obviously we know what happened in the past. Arvidsson. Arvidsson's a, that's a legit signing. Like Love that, that guy. That's a good pickup. And, you know, when you look at what Edmonton has done here, I mean, they were a very good team prior to yesterday anyway. They're on mm-hmm. paper better uh, today. You know, what, what do you make of where they're at and the fact that all these, these guys around the league are like, I don't want to leave. I want to be a part of this and probably suggest that maybe Edmonton's a, the cup favorite. Like, is, is that the case? They're the top dog right now, the team to beat? Uh, we'd have to check FanDuel, but I said yesterday at the end of our show, who's the cup favorite as of whatever, 5 p.m. yesterday? I said Edmonton. Yep. And, and for all the reasons you just said, like, you know, their goaltending, the same question marks Toronto would have about their goaltending, except they've done it in the playoffs before, both of them. But, you know, they've been there. The defense is not perfect, but Bouchard and Ekholm are one of the best pairs in the league. And Nurse and CeCe and Kulak, they just kind of manage around the rest. Broberg will grow into a game and be better and maybe knock those guys down a peg. But their forwards are so much. You know this. Like now, whether it's injuries or roster shuffles, the fact that Drysaddle won't be playing. Like, you know, Fogel had a good year. He had 20 goals. He got a nice contract because of it. Arvis is better than him. Jeff Skinner is better than him. Like the fact that they have now all these wingers and not enough centermen all of a sudden to play um, up and down the lineup makes them so much more dangerous in the long regular season as well as on through the playoffs. I, I really like the fact they would be able to return that third line. They won't play quite as well the whole year. They probably won't play together the whole year, but they have pieces there. Adam Henrique had, what do you have last year, Shreddy? 50-something points? Like, yeah. he had a really good season between two teams. And, yeah, they just seem like if they can get through the sort of injuries and the disappointment of this year and, and get into next season at some point, maybe it takes till November or December. But if they stay healthy... I don't. I mean, I think they are the favorite to get back to the Stanley Cup final, and once they're there, they'd be the favorite to win it. So yeah, I, I'm totally impressed that they managed to squeeze them all in. Yanmark just for a million and a something million and a half or whatever it is. Connor Brown for a million. Henrique for three million. Those are all deals. Their third line makes five million dollars total. Two million dollar cap. That's really good fiscal management for a team that you know has the guys making a ton at the top. Well, and, you know, that kind of leads to the question, like, what is that? Is that players hunger to play with McDavid, hunger to win a championship? and Or is that Jeff Jackson who doesn't want to be the general manager <laughs> but basically is in place of the general manager and knocks July 1st out of the park with all these signings and, <laughs> you know, making sure that he's, you know, well within his, you know, financial budget, let's say. So I think what it is is players want to win. And they're willing to probably take a little bit less to be in a good situation and have a good chance of winning. And I think everyone around the league knows the window, or the Oilers, the guaranteed window is two years. After that, you're not quite sure what's going to happen, although, you know, it's probably more likely than not it stays the same. But for two years, or one year at least, they're going to be amazing, two years. And so all those guys, Frankie, right? Skinner one year. Yanmark wanted three, but he got three. Henrik just got two. Harvison got to. They all paired up with David's timeline. It's not a coincidence. That is exactly what guys are thinking. And then they'll see what happens with McDavid and wherever he goes, and, you know, they readjust from there. But that's what you need to do. Whatever your selling point is, we have hot weather. Is it because we have great fans? Is it because we have the best player in the world? Whatever makes your team attractive, state tax, whatever, sell that. And for the Oilers, you sell dry saddle McDavid and the potential to go win a cup and you appeal to the, the competitive streak in players and it seemed like it worked pretty well yesterday. West Hampton Mall, Johnny. That is a very nice thing to go there no, shopping in the winter. The, the Bow River Valley, or whatever There's, it's called. No, 
North Saskatchewan wow. River, and they have we have three food courts in the mall. And I don't want to oversell it because I don't want everyone coming from Toronto to visit, but uh, that's where we're at. So We have the water slide and the rink in the mall. Come on. You can't beat that. Yeah, underwater. Like, we've got it all. Pitch and putt. we got it all there. Three Wendy's. It's incredible. Okay, so Jeff Skinner. Jeff Skinner. Well, what, what yeah. kind of expectations are realistic for this player, not just in a regular season, but in the playoffs where we've never seen him before? Well, we can't say the playoffs because the guy's played a thousand games and never been there. And Crazy. like, if he had offers, if there's the greatest vote of confidence that the Oilers could have felt yesterday was like the guy who has to make the playoffs on this next team. He has to because he had lots of offers. And if the Oilers don't make the playoffs, he'll never get another contract in this league because it'll be him that got, got him out of there. But like again, like Jeff Skinner is a good player. Even in even Buffalo last year, he had twenty something goals and fifty something points. So you put him with Leon Draisaitl, he'll score 30 goals next year. He'll get power play time because that power play clicks and they play the full two minutes. But if he gets any sort of secondary last 30 seconds and run on the top two lines, he will absolutely score 30 goals and get close to 60 points. Like somewhere around 30 goals, somewhere around 60 points. In the playoffs, I don't know. He's, he's always sort of scored pretty well around the league. Um, he plays with feistiness. I would expect him to be okay. I mean, I, I don't know otherwise, but... Um, hopefully they, he gets to find out. But I just think, you know, when there's been moments, if you want to put Nuge down the middle, where there's just not enough wingers to go around, now there are. You could go McDavid, Drysdale, Nuge, and Hopkins, and your third-line wingers could be like Arvidsson and Skinner. Like, how sick would that be? And I guess your fourth line would then be Skinner or would be Henrik and those guys. Like, they, they have a lot of guys I would expect him to be productive. His greatest challenge, Stretty, might be ice time because there's, there's so many good players in Edmonton. Yeah, yeah, it's Power it's play. stacked out there. It's a good scene in Edmonton. Um, well, Johnny, we'll leave it there, buddy. Uh, thanks for everything this season. We always love having you on. We'll do it a ton again come the fall, and we won't bother you anymore, although I can't guarantee you that will happen. Doogie may bother you at some <laughs> point, but feel free to just flush you know, our texts and our emails. But uh, enjoy the summer, buddy, and thank you for doing this. All right, boys. My pleasure all year long. Have a great summer. Have a safe summer. And you know what? September is going to be here before we know it. So yep. we'll talk to you then. You got it. All right. There's our good buddy Mike Johnson, our TSN hockey analyst, joining us here on the Maple Toyota Hotline. Build your next dream Toyota at Maple Toyota and check out Maple Toyota's pre owned inventory arriving daily. It's time through Toyota. Visit mapletoyota.com. Yeah, he's right. It's, it's going to be here quick. And, you know, Edmonton's in a good place. Um, talking about the Leafs right now is complicated because, you know, we just discussed where they're at who they are, what they're going to do. Um, you know, people are coming at me saying, I, you know, what are you going to stop talking about change? I, I've made my opinion very clear. Like, I, I think it was time for them to make a substantial change to the core of the team, but I don't think they're going to do that. So I'm not going to yell and scream about it every single day for the rest of time. No, and it has to be said again, Hayes. Like, O-Dog says it every time you guys talk about this. All excellent players, unbelievable players, supremely right. talented but, you know, we've, we've kind of seen now, you know, you go down this road, playoffs comes around, it looks different, it feels different, don't get past the hump. Mm -hmm. All great players, though. But great players, remember, guys, it has to change. Tavares next year's contract will look different, right? There'll be some there. And then Marner is a free agent. And, and so there could be two of the four gone next year or, yep. or reduced or changed contract in, in, in Tavares. So I honestly think Ruby wants a chance. Give him a chance to see what he can do with these guys. Because um, scoring in the playoffs, mm -hmm. it's hard. It is really, really hard to do. And uh, I think he can maybe help teach those guys how to do it. Yeah, and that's a big responsibility, clearly. But that's what comes with the territory. You know, if you're going to be the head coach, that's why you're here. You know, if you're Baruba, you're here to get to do things that Sheldon Keefe couldn't do. Mike Babcock couldn't do. Those guys got them to the playoffs every single year. So at a minimum, Baruba has got to make sure he gets them there. But he's also got to get them over the top. Um, and again, we'll see, you know, they're not going to play games for, for another few months. So a anything's still possible and there likely will be more activity and more surprises, but in terms of the big picture and who they are and what the Leafs are, you know, they're, they're a really good team. They're a really good regular season team. They need to prove that they can actually be a really good playoff team. That's on them. Um, all right. Confirm with tonight coming up. Steve Phillips in about an hour. The NBA has been crazy the last 48 hours as well. We're getting into that with Bobby Marks. Overdrive continues. TSN 1050 and on TSN 2. I can neither confirm or deny that, uh, that this is, in fact, a segment. Austin trades Andrew Raycroft to Toronto in exchange for the rights 
to Tuka Rass. It's been my honor and a privilege to serve as the general manager of the Toronto Maple Leafs Hockey Club. It's time for Confirm or Deny. Do you regret uh, giving all those gentlemen the no trades or no movement clauses? Well, I, I, I can neither confirm or deny that. I can't confirm or deny. <laughs> All right, I can't confirm that Confirm and Deny is brought to you by Summit Ford and South Lake Ford Lincoln, where there's no such thing as a no-trade clause. Any make, any model, any time, visit summitford.com or southlakeford.com. All right, boys, we know the way this works. Statements are made. We go around the table. We confirm them or we deny them. All right, very simple stuff. You guys ready to play? Let's rock. Okay, confirm and deny. The Edmonton Oilers should be considered the favorites to win the Stanley Cup next season. Clear-cut number one favorite, Edmonton Oilers. I will confirm that. They look like a better team on paper. It looks like there's a little scoring punch. I think some of the questions as far as Stuart Skinner and how he can handle the playoffs in a long run, those questions should be put to bed. The decor held up. Um, as far as where the teams are at right now, maybe Florida losing, you know, Montour. And, um, you know, like there's – the Oilers got better. Some of the other good teams kind of stayed status quo and maybe even got a little worse. Yeah, I'll confirm it as well. Um, love the depth, right? They've always had that top end, and it's always been the depth. And getting Adam Henrique was a huge get in this playoff run. You saw that transformed to third line that at times had been a challenge, right, to have it. So now they have that piece. They've added Skinner, uh, given people for uh, Leon to play with. And Arvidsson is kind of like Hyman. Um, so I think they are that group. Uh, you know, I guess going forward, is there a new manager or is, does Jackson do it? I'm not sure just because that could affect the decisions they make over the winter. But, yes, confirm. Okay, you're confirming it. Yeah, so I, I did um, a five-pack power ranking a week ago, and I had Edmonton number two on that list. Now, I had Vegas at one with the anticipation that Vegas would get a full off season, be healthy, and be active. I didn't love what I saw out of them yesterday and the way things have played out. They're up against it, and I'm not sure they have assets to go out there and be as active as they were in the past. So I'm actually going to confirm this because of what Edmonton's done here, where Edmonton is. I, I think Edmonton is at the top of the mountain. Now, that doesn't guarantee anything, as we, we all know. It doesn't mean anything on July 2nd, what people think. If you're giving me Edmonton versus the, the field, I'm taking the field all day. I mean, it's so tough to win a cup. But... I saw a clip today, Kelly McCrimmon, the GM, kind of discussing how fans are getting restless at times down in Vegas. And I'm like, they have no idea what this really is like. <laughs> that grinds your gears, man. When you hear that Vegas fans are getting restless, like I can I can feel the steam coming out of your ears. Oh, it's like, well, how do you not keep Marshall so? What are you doing with this? Like, why don't you go and get that? It's like, are you serious? Do you know what you've been afforded as a fan? You went to the cup final like nine months into your existence you won a cup six years into the league stop it um and i'm telling you there's a rude awakening coming to that market because at some point these guys are going to age out they've traded a ton of picks prospects all that they're going to be awful at some point like it's coming in vegas where they are awful and i can't wait to see how people react down there um but i still i i'm as i say that i appreciate their their approach you know, their hyperactivity, their ruthlessness, their constant chase of success. And I think that will continue with McCrimmon and McPhee and the owner out there. But, uh, yeah, I, I like where Edmonton's at right now. Confirm or deny, Austin Matthews should be the captain of the Maple Leafs next season. I'll go ahead and confirm this because I said this the night that the Leafs lost on the panel after the game. And, you know, we're probably four minutes into the hit and we're talking about the game and the series. And it kind of dawned on me, like... You know, Tavares has one year left on his deal. As much as it hasn't worked with the players involved and what happens on the ice, like maybe a change in the leadership group is something that, you know, you could apply to this team. And for me, I don't know how you guys feel, but it's been 34's team for a long time now. Even when Tavares first got here, it still felt like it was 34, 34's team. And I feel like that's even more the case now. So I will confirm that Austin Matthews should be the captain of the Leafs. I'd confirm as well, and I, I wonder if there wouldn't be a conversation between the two about a transition, a handoff, you know, whether it starts the season, mid-season. Um, and Tavares has been a good, great player in the NHL for a long time and very um, good leader, uh, but at some point you got to look to the next, and I believe he is the next, Austin Matthews. So maybe it happens sooner than later. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to deny this um, because I also I don't see 
how that's the line you draw, right? Like we've discussed this recently. Well, what are they going to do with Mitch? What are they going to do with John? So you weren't willing to, you know, push buttons. Maybe they didn't want to. Again, maybe the Leafs never wanted to actually make drastic change. But it feels as if they're not comfortable with making those players uncomfortable, right, or asking them to do something that might lead to some sort of discomfort between the re- relationship. So you're not willing to kind of force them out or move past the no movement clause, but you're going to rip the C off a guy's jersey. That just doesn't seem consistent with the way that they operate. Now, maybe they're out is that Craig Berube's here and Berube's like, I want, a, I, I want a different feel around here. Like that's what Bonus did when he got to Winnipeg, right? Stepped in there. But that was because I think Wheeler, there were some issues there in Winnipeg. I don't sense that with John Tavares. Like Tavares is the consummate pro. You can love him. You can hate him. You can, you know, I don't love his post game, his lack of emotion all the time, but you know, where you're getting out of John and John's done exactly what he basically said he was going to do. Show up and play every night, rip home goals, be predictable, be in shape, willing to talk whenever you ask him anything. Like he hasn't changed anything, you know, sure. It hasn't been good enough, but it's not John Tavares at the front of the line as to why they haven't won. If anything, it's not Matthews an indictment has to on take him. more responsibility than John for why they haven't won in the playoffs. For sure, but it's not an indictment on Tavares. Like if this but were to is, happen, though, it's gonna get like you're you're saying you're not good enough. It's you know like I know it'll be phrased as well. It's Matthews' team, and okay, it was his team four years ago, and they still gave it to John. Why didn't they give it to him the first time around? Well, that's a good question. Like they could well, they could have like you know. Uh, Landeskog, who go through the list of guys that were named captains really young in the NHL. I'm thinking right. Crosby, Landeskog, McDavid, Matthews is like he's in that category yes, of he player. Is. He should have, he could have, maybe not should have, he could have been a young captain for the Leafs. He could have. And listen, I, would I be surprised if that happened? A little bit again because of what I said, the way that they operate, the way they treat these guys, and they want them all to feel good. And they don't want to embarrass them. Um, and that's the thing. Like it would, it would embarrass Tavares. Like, and again, it's not. This isn't house league. Everyone doesn't get a shift. Everyone Unless doesn't get to be idea. Cal- That's an interesting thought, Struddy. You know, like, if he, you, you if he's wired it. that way. You can see it. I played the Canucks. We had uh, Marcus Naslin was there, and Mark Messier was our captain. Mark is the, the to be the best leader of all time in the NHL. Um, he, you know, when he was there, he dominated the room so much, not in a bad way, but he just takes up a lot of space, right? He is Mark Messier. And then he left and it was like an explosion of leadership, right? It was Marcus Nazan. It was Ed Jovanovsky. It was all these guys that all of a sudden was like unleashed them. So as you know, I'm not saying that Tavares is, is suppressing other people, but when you, you knew, Step back, and if someone else takes a seat, it's a new voice. And it's not like it changed leadership styles completely, but it's a new voice. So I, mm-hmm. I wonder if Tavares hasn't thought about it. Like, you know, he's getting near the end. He, I feel like he's the kind of guy that understands and sees that. I think well, that's let me ask a you this. really interesting viewpoint and could help Tavares greatly in terms of the way, you know, everyone feels about him and, his, and the team and maybe where they're going. Like, let me ask you this, Hayes. He's got one year left on his deal. So if he's the captain for one more year, and let's say he doesn't re-sign, you know, pretty pretty obvious who it would go to. Probably go to 34. Hmm. Let's say he came back on a on a discounted ticket. Does he still stay captain on the new deal, or is that when you would do it? Like, is is it just do you, do you push it one more year, or is it just as long as you're with us, you're the captain? I th- I think. I think ultimately how long he's here is irrelevant. Like if you feel like he's your your guy, then he's just going to continue to be your guy as long as he's on the team. You know, like you don't see the transfer of power of captaincy very often. And and generally it's because, you know, you use San Jose as an example. It was Marlowe, then it was Thornton, then it was Pavelski. It was like they kept going back to the well for a reason. We saw it in in Winnipeg, obviously, with Blake Wheeler recently. Um, I, you know, you, you look at, and Bergeron's a different player, different success, different history in the city in Boston. But he kept signing this one-year short-term deals. They didn't take it away from him. I mean, it, I guess it was Charles up until he basically started signing those deals anyway. But I don't know. I, I mean, I guess what Struddy just said is an interesting thought. Like, if John is reading the room properly, it actually, I think, could go a long way for him to just say, let me let me sit back here for a year as well. Like, you know, like maybe it'll be easier for him. You don't have to talk every day. That that captaincy and what comes with it isn't hanging over you all the time. You know, he didn't have it his first year in Toronto, but he's had it for the last five. Might be a good breather. Might be a different change of pace for Tavares to, to maybe actually hand it out and, and make it well known. Like, he made that decision to, to basically anoint Matthews or give Matthews that opportunity. 
Um, confirm it tonight. One of Vladdy Jr., Guerrero, or Bo Bichette will be playing for a different team next season. One of Vladdy or Bo? Or Bo will be playing for a different team next season. I'm going to deny this. I'm, I'm going to deny it. I, I just feel like as much as there's public outcry with this team and things need to change, whether it's the manager or players, it just feels like they're so committed to this group and they're not going to let any kind of outside noise sway them. Like if, if it's something on the field that they see, maybe there's a chance, but I'm still under the, the premise that I'm going to deny this because there's always that unlocked potential that those two in this group could still have. Deny as well. I, I just always wearing your train away talent, really good talent, right? And then maybe unrealized talent or unfulfilled talent. So no, I, I, I couldn't let these two guys walk out the door. I'm going to confirm it, um, and I think I think there's potential for a lot of change here in Toronto. Like I, I am curious to see what happens with the front office, with the coaching staff, with a lot of these veteran players between now and the trade deadline. Certainly into the off season, you know, it's a massive disappointment this year. Payroll's astronomical, and you know the the statistics and the standings speak for themselves. Also, what Bichette said last week about how he wouldn't be surprised if he was dealt at the trade deadline, that's that's a pretty substantial comment. You know, that, that might mean he's reading the tea leaves, that they're not so keen to keep him around. It may mean, you know, he's trying to will that into existence, right? And he's he and Valadie only have one year left of team control. Like, as of the end of next season, they're free. Um, I don't think the Jays will risk, you know, letting it come to that point if they can't get to a contract. And I'm not sure they want to give Bo a big contract. You look at the way he's been playing the last couple of years, it's not been that impressive. You know, he hits a lot, strikes out a lot. You know, his power numbers are okay. Defensively, he's not exactly a gold glove caliber shortstop. They've always been concerned about the way he plays short. I don't know. I think Vladdy sticks around. I think Vladdy, they find a way to sign long-term. But yet, I, I could see playing somewhere else. Um, and I, I could see drastic change here in Toronto. It better be a haul, though, Hayes. Like, wouldn't yeah, it have he's to gotta be? He's got to play himself into that, Frankie. He's yeah. got to play better. To, to Yes, he, you know, he's he's in kind of a tweener stage where he's still young, but he's not raw. He's not 21, 22, where you can mold him. Like, he's kind of figured out who he is. He's been in the league for a number of years now. So, what do you, I don't know what that looks like. I think you would expect certainly, you know, good pieces in return. But it's not – you're not trading a guy like, you know, this isn't Gunnar Henderson up for grabs. You know what I mean? This isn't right. This isn't like Juan Soto being traded. Like, Bo's not in that category because um, he's played himself out of it largely. Um, all right, there you go. Confirmed tonight. Brought to you by Summit Ford at South Lake Ford Lincoln where there's no such thing as a no-trade clause. Any make, any model, anytime, visit summitford.com or southlakeford.com. Lost Steve Phillips, that in about 45 minutes. A lot of NBA news out there the last 48 hours. Where does Bobby Mark stand on that? What does he make of Bronny James being introduced to the media in L.A.? As if they don't know him in L.A., I'm pretty sure they're aware of the way he operates. Uh, so there's a lot to get into on that front. Jason Strudwick in here. Frankie Corrado on Brian Hayes. Overdrive continues. TSN 1050 and on TSN 2. Overdrive continues, brought to you by FanDuel, bringing you everything from the opening line of the final score. Bobby Marks coming up. Jay's in action tonight. Um, lots going on here in terms of the hockey world, soccer world, basketball world, baseball world. Now, you know, you roll over, you get through July 1, free agency, and you get into uh, the baseball trade deadline later this month. And we'll see what the Jays end up doing. In terms of them actually, you know, competing, it's just – it's a foregone conclusion now. It's not going to happen. Like, there's not some miracle run coming. Um, so, do they stay in the middle, though? Like, do they just kind of hang out in that middle ground? But you can't even call it a middle ground. They're not ground. even in the middle. No, That's the, on, in the standings, they're not in the middle ground. But I guess if you looked at it on paper, you're like, there's more there. It's not happening. But in the standings, it's like it would make sense that you start selling guys off. But I don't know if you can just do that. It's that's the question here. Like, I, I don't picture a scenario where like, obviously, you're not a buyer. You can't you can't be a buyer at this point. Um, I don't know what the purpose of standing pat would be, though. That's, I guess, what you're getting to, Frankie. Like, if you're just in the middle and you're standing pat, what are you doing? 
Right. What do like you gain from that? Yeah. How's that that possibly going to work out? And you can't trade everybody. There's not always a market. And you got to have you got to feel the team, and you know you got to evaluate. And you got to be careful. You don't want to just people out and then regret that down the line. But they they have to be active as sellers at the trade deadline. You you have to. You got to determine who's not going to be a part of your program in the future. You, like, what's the point of keeping Justin Turner if someone That's wants a great him one. for a playoff yeah. run? Like exactly. what? What is the purpose of that? You know, there's what's just, the value? There's, yeah, exactly. Like you know, you, you signed him. It didn't really work out. Your team's not that great. He's 39. He's a World Series champ. Great clubhouse guy. Right-handed bat off the bench. So I'm going to give you something for that. There's no reason to have him here on August 1st. For like, sure. It just I don't see what the purpose of that would be. Um, so you know, these are the conundrums. This is the conundrum that the Jays are dealing with right now. Uh, Steve Phillips on that and more into the next hour. And we'll continue to review what happened, you know, yesterday and what else could be happening throughout the league uh, as we move forward. I, I, there's still some free agents out there, more like kind of older guys who are still around the game, but there'll be signings that'll be scattered throughout the summer. So we'll look ahead to that as well into the final hour. Struddy in here, Frankie in here. I'm Brian Hayes. Overdrive continues. Hour three up next. TSN 1050 and on TSN 2.